Ah, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think the phone got clipped off at the end there, but nevertheless, it's uh, wonderful to have you all here today. Welcome, and thank you very much for participating in today's session on pandemic musings on the courts, insurance, and health law. I'm Jerry Roth, the president of UIA. I just wanted to thank our panelists for <clears throat> participating this morning. It's morning here in San Francisco. I know it's different hours all over the world where people are participating. And I want to thank our uh, participants for uh, listening in. Um, as I think all of you know, UIA has been very active during this pandemic period with webinars virtually every day, uh, podcasts, videos, a whole slew of online activity. I hope you're all uh, taking advantage of that. We look forward to being in touch with you through those various uh, means, uh, through our newsletter, through our juris, through our programs that we've been uh, actively uh, continuing with, such as UIA Advance for our law firms and uh, UIA Mentor for mentoring young lawyers. With that, I want to turn the floor over uh, to the moderator today, Chris Kennedy. I, uh, Chris, uh, good luck. Morning. And I will be turning off my camera to get out of your way. And I wish you all a wonderful seminar and look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to uh, a, an, I would think will be a very interesting hour and a half with some great panelists. Um, my name is Christopher Kendi. I'm a member of the law firm of Cozen O'Connor based uh, in Philadelphia, but I'm in the New York office. Uh, and I would like to briefly uh, present the panelists. Uh, very unfortunately, uh, one of our panelists, Jan Mulligan, had a personal uh, emergency and was not able to be here today with us. But uh, my partner, Greg Filzar, who's in the same general area, is going to cover her presentation as well. Uh, so in the order of uh, presentations, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Honorable Peter uh, M. Reyes, Jr. Uh, he's a judge on the Minnesota Court of Appeals. He began his career as a judicial law clerk for the Honorable Salvador M. Rosas, then joined Robbins Kaplan as an associate in the Intellectual Property uh, Litigation Department. He subsequently worked as a senior IP lawyer at Cargill Incorporated and as a partner at Barnes and Thornburg LLP. Uh, Judge Reyes is a very active member of a number of local, state, and national bar associations and nonprofit organizations. Uh, he served as president of the Minnesota Hispanic Bar Association from 2000 to 2003 and national president of the Hispanic National Bar Association from 2012 to 2013. He's also active in the ABA as a member of the House of Delegates uh, the ABA Judicial Division, the Business Law Section, Section of IP Law, and TIPS, among others. Currently, he serves on the Commission on Women in the Legal Profession. Judge Reyes is also an active member of the UIA, obviously, including the Biotechnology Commission and the U.S. National Committee, uh, and he obviously participated in a wonderful panel we had last year in Luxembourg. It was my pleasure to be on the same panel with him. Among his recognitions in 2012 and 13, uh, Poder magazine named him as one of the 100 most influential Hispanics in America. Judge Reyes received the Otley Award, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, in 2016, the highest award given out by the Mexican government to a non-Mexican citizen, and received, received the HNBA Latino Judge of the Year Award in 2018. 2019, Judge Reyes received the MHBA Courage and Leadership Award and the ABA 2019 Spirit of Excellence Award. Uh, the judge received his undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of St. Thomas and his law degree from Mitchell Hamlin College of Law, graduating with honors. Judge, it's a pleasure to have you and thank you for taking the time. I am sure you are extremely busy and we really appreciate the time you're taking to participate. Um, our next speaker will be Francois uh, it's a, a French lawyer uh, at the Barreau of Paris. Uh, she is a founding uh, member of the firm Prel Heke Paye Godel, um, uh, who is involved in litigation, arbitration, and mediation in the areas of industrial risk, insurance, construction, um, and the law of uh, civil responsibility and commercial law. Uh, I've known Francoise for many years. She's a former chair of my commission, the Insurance Law Commission, uh, and she is uh, a former member of the uh, 
Conseil de l'Ordre of the Lawyers of the Paris Bar and member of the Bureau of the ACE, of ACE. Uh, with, with Françoise today is her colleague, um, Cécile uh, Tiberguin, um, who has been a member of the Paris Bar, Bar since 2001 and a member of the New York Bar since 2013. Congratulations on passing the New York Bar. Um, she's of counsel to PHPG, uh, speaks English and German, and is a member of the French American Bar Association. She has an LLM from NYU, where I went to law school, so it's not an easy place to get a degree from. Um, I was younger at the time and smarter, that's how I got passed, got my degree. 20, she got her master's in 2012 and degree from the University of Paris to Pontéon Assas in European Business Law in 1999 and University of Paris 10 Nanterre postgraduate degree in French and German Civil Law in 1998. Our next panelist is um, uh, Lorenzo Locatelli, another uh, former chair of my insurance law commission. Um, he's born in Milan and he uh, has his own law firm in Padova. Uh, he was awarded the degree with full marks in 1985-86 from the University of Bologna. She, he is the director of the School for Lawyers of Padova, Padua, uh, and um, he has a degree in cultural intellectual property from the University of Bologna. Um, he has a degree in civil and insurance law from the University of Bologna, Bologna from 2016 and has been admitted to the Court of Appeal uh, and the professional role of Venice uh, from 1989 and the Supreme Court from 2002. Uh, he's an honorary judge from 1992 to 1997 in the Court of Padua and president of the Padova Bar Associate Bar Council from 2008 to 2015 and secretary of the Bar Council from 2000 to 2007. He's also, as I mentioned, the former president of the Insurance Law Commission of the UIA. Um, he's a, um, he has written many articles in Italian, which unfortunately I could not even pronounce, much less understand the meaning of. Um, I've got five pages of articles. He's uh, extremely, um, recognized and um, uh, uh, very, uh, very uh, competent in his area. Um, uh, Jan Mulligan, unfortunately, can't be here, as I mentioned. Uh, just briefly, she's a trial lawyer and founder of the California law firm of Mulligan, Bannum, and Findlay, representing consumers in cases involving personal injury, medical malpractice, and health data breaches. She graduated from the University of San Diego Law School and is a member, as a member of the Order of the Coif which is the equivalent of Phi Beta Kappa for those who don't know uh, in law school. Ms. Mulligan graduated from the Jerry Spence Trial Lawyers College and the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution Pepperdine Law School. She's president of the Health Law Commission, one of the sponsors of this, of this uh, uh, seminar webinar today, um, and is also past chair of the ABA TIPS Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Committee. Uh, she previously served in various ABA leadership roles including membership on the TIPS Council, past chair of the ABA Standing Committee on Medical Profession Liability, and as a TIPS delegate in the ABA House of Delegates. Uh, finally, uh, Greg Lazar, uh, who's uh, one of my partners in the Philadelphia office. Uh, Greg focuses his practice on health law and handles a variety of health law litigation, regulatory and compliance matters for a number of different types of health care providers. He has significant ex experience with HIPAA, and privacy issues and has counseled insurance company clients on understanding their obligations under the Medical Secondary Payer Act. He returned to Cozen after briefly serving as Associate General Counsel to Universal Health Services. He's written and spoken about a number of health law issues, including a seminar which Jan and I, along with the um, Biotech Commission uh, Chair, uh, uh, Song Wei, uh, participated in last June in New York, which was very well received. Um, and um, he's been named a Pennsylvania super lawyer, rising star for health care in 2005, 2006, 2010, 2011. He worked previously as a clinical psychologist in inpatient and outpatient settings and was a clinical instructor of psychiatry at the MCP Hahnemann School of Medicine in Philadelphia. He's currently the co-chair of the ABA's joint OPOI, OPOI tax force. Opoid Fat Tax Force, excuse me. In addition, he is former member of the boards of directors of the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania and the ALFA and HIV AIDS Service Organization in Hickory, North Carolina. 
His BA is from Notre Dame, got a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology from Texas Tech University, and his law degree summa cum laude from the University of Pittsburgh Law School, where he was research editor of the University of Pittsburgh Law Review and a member of Order of the Coif as well. So those are the um, illustrious uh, people that uh, we are going to be talking, here. you're going to be hearing from today. Uh, and I'd like to invite Peter Reyes, Judge Reyes to kick off with his overview of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the courts. Uh, thank you, Peter, for participating again, and we await your presentation. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, there's, there's a lot to cover and not a lot of time, so this is just going to be an overview. And quite frankly, I, I think the word musings to describe uh, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna be covering today is, is, a, is, a good, is a good word to use because it really is musings because things are changing at a very, very rapid pace here with respect to the courts and how we go about making sure that the rule of law is followed, that people have access to the courts, but we do it in a way that keeps people safe. And when I'm talking about the people, I'm talking about the litigants. I'm talking about the lawyers, court personnel, witnesses, observers, the jurors, and of course, the judges. There are numerous issues implicated, and I really want to focus on two different areas of, of uh, to, to talk about today, and that's uh, briefly on legal and practical issues. There are a number of legal issues that you need to consider in terms of litigation. First and foremost, what are the local rules? What are the statutes? What's the case law, depending on what country you're in? Obviously, in the US, case law is very, very important. But also, what are the possible constitutional issues? Those are, those are things that we are looking at and, and trying to make sure that we address through the courts. For example, you have in criminal cases, there are a number of rights that litigants have. First, first of, among them is the confrontation clause under uh, Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Every defendant has a right to confront their accuser or accusers and cross-examine them. Now, these people could be victims, peace officers, uh, observers, people who might have seen what had occurred. Those are mm -hmm people that need to come into the court and the, the defendant needs to have the ability to be able to confront them in some way as well as be able to cross-examine them. You also have a right to a trial by a jury in criminal prosecutions. That's under Article 3, Section 2. That also is impl implicates the, the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution as well. And under that, interestingly enough, you all have not only a right to a speedy trial, but you also have a right to a public trial. So that means that anybody who wants to watch the proceedings has the right to do so and has to be given that access. How do you do that in a way that keeps people safe? In civil cases, we have the same issue in the United States where you have a right to a trial by a jury. Now, there's a slight difference between the two. In a criminal case, particularly if it's a gross misdemeanor or a felony, you have a right to a jury of up to 12 people. You can have it six people, but it can be up to 12 people. Right now, the way our courthouses and our courtrooms are set up at the district court level, you have 12 people that are in very, very close proximity to each other in the jury box. How do you ensure their safety? How do you make sure that they are keeping a uh, social distance of six feet apart. When you have jurors brought in, there's usually a large holding room where you have tens if not hundreds of people that are sitting together in close proximity. Again, how do you manage that logistically? And I'm gonna talk about the logistical and practical implications uh, very briefly, very shortly here. You also have the right, as I mentioned earlier, the right to a speedy trial. So particularly with criminal defendants, when they are arrested, they're brought into jail. And depending on the charge and depending whether or not they can post bail, they may be sitting in jail overnight. If they're brought in or on a Friday evening or over the weekend, they may be there for two or three nights over the weekend. And they're going to want to get out as quickly as possible. In order to do that, you have to have a hearing before a judge 
to set bail to determine whether or not the person can even be released on their own recognizance. And you uh, have to have that hearing. You want to have those hearings fairly quickly. Those hearings are, at least in Minnesota, and I, I understand in most states throughout the country, in the United States, are being held to in order to allow people that right to be released on bail. But you also have the people that are in, in jail as well. You have the issue of how do you make sure that everybody is keeping a safe distance from each other. You also have the right, and, and so those are some of the rights that, that people have that are implicated throughout the court system that we are, as a court, trying to address uh, on a daily basis. And uh, we have, for example, here in Minnesota, we have uh, the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court has put together a number of different committees to look at what we need to do consistent with the governor of the state of Minnesota, his orders. Right now, we currently have a stay at home order that is set to expire and then it will be replaced by a stay safe order. Those orders vary from state to state within the United States. Other countries obviously have their own orders or rules or regulations that are in place that every litigant needs to make sure that they are aware of in terms of when they are representing their clients in court and that's something that lawyers need to keep abreast of because many times it is a move, it changes and it can change at a moment's notice. There are other issues that have come up and as we go forward, we're going to see more and more challenges on issues with respect to safety in terms of social distancing, but also in terms of the laws that are in place. For example, the and, and these can also implicate implicate constitutional issues just last week there an issue came up with respect to the right to free exercise under the free exercise clause the first amendment right to gather and in north carolina they had a federal judge who just on last friday actually um, issued an, an order uh, I'm sorry, struck down an order prohibiting services to groups of more than 10 people for religious gatherings. And I think we're going to see more and more of these challenges as, as we go forward. Uh, interestingly enough, on Saturday, there was an article that talked about how despite, uh, well, some states actually have exempted religious organizations and religious gatherings from stay safe or stay at home orders, which would allow different religious organizations to, to meet together. But interestingly enough, there's an article in the, the news just on Saturday in Boot County in California, there is a person who had tested positive for COVID-19 who had exposed 180 people in that gathering to COVID-19. So even though there is the right to gather uh, under, under the US Constitution, there are some significant implications with respect to the exercise of that right. So we have another issue that, that came up recently. And that, again, this is one that came up just last week. And like I said, this is just an overview because these issues are going to uh, occur on a more frequent basis, I believe, as we go forward. The Supreme Court of Wisconsin, state right next to us, ordered, a, a, issued a decision that actually struck down the Wisconsin governor's stay at home order. And the state governor said he's not going to appeal that decision, he's just going to make modifications to it. So in terms of what are some of the practical considerations that lawyers and judges need to take into account. How can we make sure that we ensure the safety of everyone involved in the legal system? Are we going to, are courts going to require every person that comes into a courthouse now to wear a mask? Do you need to wear gloves? What do you need to make sure that you are keeping a six foot distance between you and others? How do we do that in a packed courtroom? Court, 
the courtrooms can vary in size. We have some larger courtrooms, but many of the courtrooms are, are quite small. Do we set up ITV so that people can watch it from adjacent rooms so everybody is spaced six feet apart? Or jurors, do you put plastic or glass panels between each of the jurors so they can sit next to each other, but they're not exposing each other, uh, breathing on, on each other? These are all practical considerations that the courts are looking at in terms of how do we move forward. Another way that we are addressing these issues and we are doing it even right now is by having hearings either virtually or telephonically. So for instance, the Minnesota Supreme Court and our court, the Minnesota Court of Appeals, we are continuing to hold hearings, oral arguments with litigants. We are doing it with technology similar to this go-to webinar that we have, where we use WebEx, other courts are using Zoom in terms of virtual hearings. Uh, we've had, and I've participated in a number of hearings already where we have the litigants uh, making the arguments virtually and all the judges on our panel are there as well. And so far, a knock on wood, it's, it's worked out fairly well. That's one of the ways that courts are moving forward. Another is having telephonic hearings. And we've seen for the first time, the United States Supreme Court has held telephonic hearings. And I'm gonna to touch on uh, one example, a practical example in just a minute here, but they are not only holding telephonic hearings with litigants, but they are actually being streamed live. So you can listen as it goes along to oral arguments at the United States Supreme Court for the first time. There are also limited in-person hearings. I talked about that. That mainly address it, it relates to district courts in terms of their hearings and uh, limitations on uh, that. Considerations that have to be taken into account also are one issue we've already come across is uh, participants who are hearing impaired cannot attend virtual hearings. So while virtual hearings and telephonic hearings work to a certain extent, they don't cover all situations. Finally, I, I would like to talk about some considerations for litigants. Make sure that you're familiar with all the various platforms, technology platforms. Be engaged just as you would in court. Make sure you dress for the part. Avoid the temptation to take breaks. And I mentioned a minute ago about telephonic hearings before the United States Supreme Court, just to show you some of the dangers and the pitfalls for lawyers as they're litigating before the uh, courts. Here's a, a recording of what happened recently with the US Supreme Court in arguments. And you'll hear a vi uh, an audio. And shortly after there's a mention to the FTC, you will hear a very disturbing noise in the background. So Colette, if you could play that audio and video. So unfortunately that shows some of the challenges that parties and litigants face when they are appearing by a telephone in, in courts. What you heard in the background there, if you could not hear it, was somebody was flushing a toilet. And I'm not, I don't know if they've identified who the person was, but I'm not sure if you want to be the person identified as someone who has taken a, a bio break, taken a bathroom break while you're making arguments for the United States Supreme Court. So with that, just some final thoughts to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, we're all in this together. It is something that uh, nobody ha had expected, but we are all officers of the court, whether you're judges, lawyers are officers of the court. We're learning as, as, we're, as we're going through. This is a new paradigm. We cannot go back to the way things were before. And we need to be forward looking and embrace this change, which I think can have a silver lining. So thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you very much for your consideration. I now turn it back over to our moderator, Chris Kenny. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, I was on mute just in case the same thing might have happened while you were speaking. Um, luckily, it didn't. I, thank you so much. It's extremely interesting, and it obviously is a uh, system in flux, and I do think it's going to be some kind of a new world. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the presentation that I will be, um, I saw Peter had a question. Um, I will I will be gathering all the questions uh, myself so that the panelists aren't distracted. And then at the end of the session, hopefully there'll be a little bit of time. I'll be making notes and we'll pass those questions on uh, to the extent we have time to pass them on. So please people don't think you're being ignored by the speaker because he's not he or she is not responding to the question. We're, we're trying to keep a flow by not distracting the, uh, the the present the presenters, but I have noted the question and I will pass it on at the end. Um, so thank you again, Peter. We do appreciate your time. Uh, anyway, the, the next speakers are um, uh, uh, Francois Zeke and uh, Cecile from her law firm, and they're going to be talking about the impact of the um, uh, pa uh, the pandemic on the French legal profession and with some insurance considerations as well. Um, and just for your information. Uh, Cecile is going to present first, and then Françoise will, in English, Françoise will pre present a few slides in French, and Cecile will summarize uh, Françoise's uh, French presentation. So, Françoise and Cecile, la parole est à vous. Merci. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, Cecile et moi-même sommes très heureuses de partager avec vous cet échange webinar. Nous allons vous parler de la façon dont la France a fait face à l'épidémie de coronavirus en limitant notre propos à l'aménagement des délais et à l'organisation des tribunaux, puis à la qualification juridique de cette crise, et enfin à la façon dont elle a été abordée par le secteur de l'assurance. Cécile, de la parole. Thank you, François. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, we will talk about the way France uh, responded, the French legal system adapted to the situation in terms of uh, time limits and organization of courts. And then Françoise will speak about the legal qualification of the crisis before speaking of the way the insurance sector responded to the crisis. So as a first part, I will speak about the way the French legal system adapted to uh, this exceptional situation. The French government enacted on the next slide, Okay, so the French government enacted the emergency law to face the COVID-19 epidemic on the 23rd of March. This law was published on the 24th of March and it came into effect immediately. Uh, Article 4 of this law declares the état d'urgence sanitaire, which is a health emergency period of two months, starting on the 24th of March, but which was recently extended until the 10th of July. Article uh, 11 authorizes the government to take measures which are normally taken by the legislative power to face the consequences of the epidemic. These measures are, um, the government took several measure orders based on Article uh, 11 of the emergency law, in particular, one order extending time limits during the period of health emergency, and one order simplifying the rules of court operation. The order uh, number uh, 306 of the 25th of March, uh, extending time limits, creates a period of legal protection, which is a period during which almost nothing can happen. All deadlines and measures expiring during this period are extended. The period of legal protection does not coincide with the health emergency period. It is wider as, as it starts on the 12th of March and ends one month after the end of the health emergency period. So if the health emergency period terminates on the 10th of July, as it is the case to date, the period of legal protection will terminate on the 10th of August. Obviously, this order does not apply to deadlines already expired, which expired before the 12th of March, 
and to deadlines which will be uh, which will expire after the 10th of August or after the end of the period of legal protection. Next slide. The slide before. No, the slide. Yeah. This order applies to acts prescribed by law or regulation which should have been carried out during the period of legal protection. We are talking about acts, recourses, claims, formalities, registration, declaration, publication, notifications. This order applies to all time limits, regardless of whether they uh, result in time limitation, foreclosure, lapse, or in the loss of a right. These acts are deemed timely if they are carried out within a period of time which may not exceed two months after the end of the legal protection period. Uh, if the time originally prescribed by law or regulation to carry out the act or the formality was shorter than two months, then the act or formality will be considered as timely if it was carried out uh, within the original time limit starting at the end of the period of legal protection. And conversely, if the time prescribed by the law or regulation to carry out uh, this act of formality is longer than two months, then the act of formality will have to be uh, carried out within two months after the end of the period of legal protection at the latest. The order does not apply to acts provided for uh, in a contract, so contractual deadlines. So, for example, deadlines to exercise an option or payments provided for in a contract are not covered by the order. But contractual partners can invoke force majeure or other mechanism provided for by the Code Civil uh, if the crisis renders the enforcement of the contract impossible for them. Françoise will speak about this later. Article 3 of the order enumerates the measures which are automatically extended for a period of two months after the end of the period of legal protection if they were supposed to be completed during this period. Among these measures, you can notice the measures of investigation or instructions so, for example, uh, court expertise proceedings, which are very important in France, uh, are totally suspended during uh, this period. Uh, conciliation, mediation measures as well. Article 4 concerns penalty mechanisms in case of the non-fulfillment of an obligation. According to this order, Penalty payment and penalty clauses, which started to take effect before the 12th of March, are suspended during the period of legal protection, but they will start again the day after the end of this period. And penalty payments, penalty clauses, termination clauses, and clauses providing for forfeiture when their purpose is to sanction uh, a non fulfillment of an obligation. Uh, which expired during the period of legal protection are frozen until one month after the end of the period of legal protection, but uh, they will take effect again uh, after this month if the debtor has not fulfilled uh, the obligation. Although this order does not apply to acts provided for by contracts, there are some, there are some exceptions. The penalty clauses and other mechanisms sanctioning the non-fulfillment of an obligation I've just talked about are an exception. Uh, another couple of exceptions is provided for by Article 5. It concerns contracts which uh, can only be terminated during a specific period of time which expires during the period of legal protection or the contracts which are automatically renewed in the absence of an express termination within a specific time frame which expired during the uh, legal uh, protection period. For this contract, Article 5 provides for an extension of two months after the end of the period of legal protection 
for the of the deadline to terminate uh, these contracts. The second relevant order. Next slide is the order number uh, 2020, uh, sorry, 304, simplifying the functioning of judicial courts in order to prevent the spread of the epidemic in courts. This order specifies that the deadlines extension provided for by the Article 306 uh, I've just talked about is, is applicable to judicial courts. So for instance, the deadline to lodge an appeal is automatically extended, as well as the deadlines for the parties to file their briefs or for the judges to render their decisions. The order provides for the postponement of the majority of hearings, which were supposed to take place during the containment period, the possibility to reduce the composition of the court to one single judge, the simplification of the notifications and correspondences between the parties and between the parties and the court. These notifications can be made by all means. So uh, electronic mails, certified letter with re re uh, acknowledgement of uh, receipts, simple letters, telephone calls, etc. However, it is recommended to keep an evidence of the notification, which is more difficult when it occurs by simple letter or by telephone calls, obviously. And in addition, the judge uh, must make sure that the adversarial principle is complied with, which means that he, he has to make sure that all the parties receive the same level of information. The order provides further for the possibility for the judges to derogate from the principle of public debate by organizing hearing without public, or via uh, video conferencing. And the judge can even decide to remove the oral pleadings. I will now let Francoise tell you more about this possibility. Alors, euh, l'article 8 de l'ordonnance autorise donc le juge à décider que la procédure se déroulera sans audience sans qu'il lui soit nécessaire de recueillir préalablement l'accord des parties. Cette possibilité d'une procédure sans audience existait déjà en droit commun, mais elle était soumise à l'accord préalable des parties, et elle était donc prévue à l'article 828 du Code de procédure civile et à l'article L212.5.1 du Code de l'organisation judiciaire. Avec l'ordonnance, le juge n'a plus besoin de l'accord des parties. Cette possibilité est toutefois soumise à certaines conditions. Elle n'existe que dans les procédures pour lesquelles la représentation par avocat est obligatoire et dans les autres cas, si les parties sont représentées par un avocat. Le tribunal doit en informer les parties par tout moyen et il y a une possibilité pour les parties de s'y opposer dans un délai de 15 jours. Dans ce cas, le tribunal peut maintenir l'audience, mais sous une forme simplifiée. Nous avons également, comme il a été mentionné tout à l'heure, le juge unique ou la vidéoconférence. Ou encore, il y a une possibilité de renvoyer l'affaire à une date, mais qui risque d'être lointaine. So this procedure without a hearing is possible. Um, uh, it, it already exists in, uh, it's already provided by the civil uh, procedural code, but uh, in uh, normal uh, law, procedural rules, uh, the uh, judge must obtain the prior consent of the parties. With this exceptional situation, the judge does not have to obtain the party's prior consent. But this, this possibility is subject to uh, strict conditions and is only possible in proceedings where the parties are represented by a lawyer. Force majeure. Une autre, une autre question intéressante est celle de la qualification ou non euh, de euh, l'épidémie de coronavirus euh, comme un, étant un événement euh, de force majeure. 
Il est certain que cette crise a rendu plus difficile, voire impossible, l'exécution de certains contrats. Afin qu'elle puisse être qualifiée de force majeure, il faut qu'elle remplisse trois conditions. Extériorité par rapport aux parties, imprévisibilité et irrésistibilité. Euh, si cette condition, enfin, la condition d'extériorité est acquise à l'évidence, cela est beaucoup moins certain pour les deux autres conditions. Donc, il y aura imprévisibilité pour les contrats qui ont été signés entre janvier 2020 et euh, donc oui janvier 2020, puisque l'épidémie euh, qui s'est vissée en Chine n'était pas connue. Nous retiendrons probablement euh, la euh, qualification, enfin, l'imprévisibilité pour les contrats signés entre janvier et mi-mars 2020, c'est-à-dire jusqu'à ce que le gouvernement euh, ait décidé du confinement. En revanche, on ne pourra pas considérer qu'il y ait imprévisibilité pour les contrats qui auraient été signés après cette date. So, Françoise is talking about the condition of unpredictability, uh, which is uh, sure for contracts which were signed before uh, January 2020, before we heard, we the public heard about the um, uh, epidemic in China uh, in, uh, in its existence. Then uh, it's probably also uh, the case for contracts which were signed between January and the mid of mid March because uh, the government took the uh, measures only uh, mid-March uh, 2020, and before it was really uh, hard for the public to uh, believe that uh, the uh, epidemic would uh, have this extent. So, reste la troisième condition, qui est l'irrésistibilité, qui pose plus de difficultés et pour plusieurs raisons. Le ministre de l'Économie a indiqué que le coronavirus constituait un cas de force majeure, de sorte que le gouvernement n'appliquerait pas de pésalité aux entreprises qui seraient en retard sur les chantiers publics. Mais le ministre, du, enfin, le ministre du Travail a de son côté reproché aux entreprises du secteur du bâtiment l'arrêt des chantiers, alors qu'elles pouvaient s'organiser pour trouver des solutions et continuer leur activité. Le ministre de l'Intérieur a adressé un courrier au préfet demandant un maintien des chantiers de construction. Donc, l'on voit que la position du gouvernement n'est pas tranchée. The government's position about the uh, irresistibility condition is not settled at all because some ministers say one thing and other ministers say other things. Voilà, donc il convient de euh, se tourner vers la jurisprudence pour tenter d'en savoir davantage, euh, sachant qu'en dernier lieu, ce sont les juridictions qui auront à se prononcer sur la qualification ou non de la force majeure. Alors, il n'existe pas encore de dé décision relative au coronavirus, ou très peu. Nous n'avons pas de décision significative. Nous avons une décision de la Cour d'appel de Colmar du 12 mars 2020 dans une affaire de droit de l'immigration. Mais à l'exception de cet arrêt, c'est l'examen des décisions rendues pour d'autres épidémies qui permettent de dégager des critères qui peuvent laisser penser que la force majeure sera retenue pour le coronavirus. So based on uh, the few cases we have uh, rendered uh, concerning other epidemics because we have uh, no significant decision concerning the COVID-19, uh, we can uh, infer that uh, courts will Uh, consider that this pandemic uh, is a force majeure event. Alors, l'analyse des, des décisions est la suivante. Nous avons deux décisions qui ont rejeté la qualification de force majeure pour euh, le chikungunya et la dengue. Dans le premier cas, c'était la Cour d'appel de Bastère, le 17 décembre 2018, qui a considéré que l'épidémie de chikungunya ne pouvait être considéré comme ayant un caractère imprévisible et surtout irrésistible, puisque dans tous les cas, la maladie soulagée par des antalgiques est généralement surmontable. Dans le second cas, c'est la Cour d'appel de Nancy le 22 novembre 2010 qui a retenu que l'épidémie de dengue ne revêtait pas les caractéristiques de la force majeure, puisque notamment 
cette maladie a concerné environ 5% de la population et ne présentait pas de complications dans la majorité des cas. Les juges se sont donc fondés sur la gravité limitée de la maladie pour considérer qu'elle ne revêtait pas les caractéristiques de la force majeure. A contrario, il pourrait donc être soutenu que le coronavirus, dont le taux de mortalité est assez élevé, pourrait recevoir la qualification de force majeure. So there are, uh, among the four decisions listed on the slide, the first two decisions rejected the qualification of force majeure concerning uh, epidemics of chikungunya and dengue. And in both cases, this was because they considered that the, the sickness was not uh, serious enough and could be uh, overcome by the patients and by, uh, by the parties. Um, conversely, we could uh, consider that uh, the COVID-19 epidemic is more serious uh, considering the death rate and the no number of persons infected. Alors, deux autres décisions ont retenu Excuse la qualité. Je suis désolé de vous interrompre, Françoise, mais nous devons vraiment nous arrêter très rapidement parce que nous avons d'autres speakers et nous n'avons pas beaucoup de temps. Donc, peut-être que vous pouvez vous arrêter en une minute. Alors, deux autres décisions ont retenu donc la qualification euh, pour la brucellose euh, et la gastro-entérite. Donc, dans les deux cas, les motifs peuvent être transposés à l'épidémie de coronavirus, à savoir une contagiosité importante, une absence de maîtrise du phénomène et une imprévisibilité dans son ampleur. So, uh, the other decisions uh, let us uh, think that the court will conclude that the COVID-19 epidemic is a first major uh, event. Alors, Next slide. Next. I think we have to we have to stop now, Francoise. I'm so sorry because it's just we just have uh, we don't have a lot of time to, to put in. We have four more ah. speakers. So, Alors, est-ce que je peux dire deux mots juste en matière d'assurance? Could you just, just it's all right, just very quickly, like one minute, Cecile, maybe in English to just wrap up and then we'll we'll move on. Okay. This is just to say that, uh, as you know, the main problem for insurance, uh, the insurance sector, is that uh, the losses of profits are usually uh, not uh, covered uh, in such cases because uh, there, were, there were no uh, material damages covered. And as non consecutive immaterial damages, they are usually not covered. And also, uh, the policy, insurance policies uh, do not provide for specific insurance for this kind of uh, risks. So uh, the insurance sector said first, uh, we uh, will not uh, have uh, to cover this crisis, but there was a strong pressure of the government and, and the insureds. And uh, finally, on an extra contractual basis and as a solidarity, the insurance sector accepted to participate in the national effort and the effort of the insurance sector amounts to uh, approximately uh, 3.2 billion euro for the moment. Thank okay, you. well, I, I have to stop you now so that we can get to the other speakers, but thank you so much, Francoise and Cécile. Um, it was very interesting. The slides, I believe, are available to everybody uh, yes. to review. Uh, and thank you so much for the presentation. So I'd like to move very quickly to Lorenzo if we could, and Lorenzo, it's, it's, your, it's your turn. Lorenzo, are you there? Did we lose Lorenzo? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. Okay, Lorenzo, it's 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 your it's your turn. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I have to move my slides, but I I think you can do that on your computer directly. With the there you go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So and turn on your video. And Lo Lorenzo, excuse me to interrupt you. You have to turn on your video also. Your webcam. 
Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I will try to illustrate some of the effects of the emergency due to COVID-19 on insurance contracts in Italy. Oh, next slide. Okay. Thank you. We can start to say that risk is a term that is invading us these days. We have epidemic risk, pandemic risk, economic risk, and the risk of making mistakes. <clears throat> and uh, Nicholas Luhmann, uh, a German sociologist and a philosopher, said that, that insurance turns the danger of an event happening, like death, illness, loss of assets, and so on, into a different risk. We think uh, of the rain as an adverse event and uh, uh, the umbrella as insurance. Before the umbrella was invented, there was the danger of rain and therefore of getting wet or not getting wet. After the invention of the umbrella, the danger changes. Now the risk is having or not having an umbrella, having or not having an insurance. No one can prevent the rain but they can protect all or part of the negative consequences. In the same way, today we can say that there is no security against the danger of the pandemic, but there is the possibility of insurance against the financial effects of the pandemic. In the event of a pandemic, the highest risk areas are three, travel policies, business policies, and health policies. Pandemic is not a new risk for the insurance industry. I don't want to remember Bill Gates' famous speech about what would be the next death threat to the world. I found an interesting article in Italy of January uh, 2019 of the Veronese Foundation magazine when the World Health Organization identified 10 particularly insidious which had to be faced immediately. Among them, at number three, we find the categorical statement that the world will face another flu pandemic. The only thing we do not know is when it will strike and how serious it will be. In Italy, the main focus in recent days has been on medical liability and, as a result, professional liability insurance. This is essentially happening for a reason that is not only legal, but also emotional due to pandemic situation. This is a picture that has had a lot of prominence in our country. It was taken by a doctor and depicted a nurse sleeping exhausted in front of a PC after hours and hours of uninterrupted work. In this field, the coronavirus pandemic may have repercussions on issues of increased risk. I'm thinking of an increase in the number of medical staff employed in a given facility, a case of a policy that guarantees not only the hospital, but also individual employees or collaborators. I'm thinking of the establishment of new departments, including field hospitals, with the introduction of non-specialist doctor to, doctors to work. We have also the so-called business interruption policies and currently not very widespread in Italy, but I'm sure that after this event, they will know better times. The insured person is guaranteed for the interruption of the business due to a variety of reasons. And the epidemic of pandemic can be included, of course. This also in the case where government authorities have closure obligations to control the evolution of infections. Sometimes ambiguous cover indications such as other catastrophes are included in the policies. Other catastrophes means floods, explosions, phenomenon like linked uh, to natural events and probably does not include pandemic. Particularly interesting in the position for the so-called CGL, commercial general liability policies, essentially producer liability policies of the insured, which could be affected by claims from customers who may claim to have contracted the virus on the insured person's premises, like offices and shop. And many of these policies, however, contain specific exclusion for viruses. 
Then there are event cancellation policies. The pandemic has led to the cancellation of many concerts in stadiums and parks, many of them during the summer, not to mention sporting events. For example, to remember a sensational case, if in, even if it did not happen in Italy, the policy taken out about the, organiza the organizers of Wimbledon tournament had a particular resonance in the English market. It's the result of an idea for insurance coverage, coverage dating back to 2003, following, following fears of the SARS epidemic. It could bring then 100 million euros into the coffers of the All England Club. In Italy, we have had the phenomenon in these days of the conversion of some industrial productions towards surgical masks and personal protective equipment. It's clear that the insurance department will be faced with the request to extend liability coverage. Producing t-shirts is different from producing surgical masks and the risk is obviously different. The manufacturer is the same, but the product changes and the insurance has to change with it. Another interesting topic, in my opinion, is that of the employer's liability in the case of an employee affected by coronavirus at work. A first aspect is the drastic reduction of negative events due to the closure of industries. A second aspect is to understand whether, according to Italian law, infection with COVID-19 is an accident or an occupational disease. A debate has just begun in recent days in Italy in this regard, and this issue is important in relation to the accident policies taken out. The question is, does an accident policy also ensure COVID-19 infection? Many accident policies contain the exclusion of infection of any kind, but some do not. And it's likely that a number of disputes will arise on this point. A recent Italian law has expressly qualified COVID-19 accident at work with regard to social insurance, but the problem remains open with regard to private insurance. And finally, let's come to motor liability. The problem, in my opinion, characteristic of the guarantee of civil liability for the circulation of vehicles is the absolute reduction in risk because circulation, as we have all seen, is reduced to a minimum. Some insurance have intervened in Italy, offering their policyholders discounts on future policies or the return of one month's premium, for example, for the motor insurance policy. We are at the end of my very short speech. Charles Sanders Peirce, a philosopher of pragmatism, said that insurance is exactly the way we normally handle the case in our lives. He liked to say that each of us is an insurance company, meaning that each of us, unable to get to the truth of things, tries to get closer to guess in the future with some approximation by lensing our existential bets. The conclusion is that logic requires that our interests should not be limited and should not stop at our personal destiny, but should concern the whole community. Pears concluded by saying that to be logical, people cannot be selfish. And I hope this difficult emergency situation can lead us to learn something in terms of solidarity. Thank you very much. Lorenzo, that was that was terrific and, and of a great such intellectual quality. And I hope our our, our particular government is listening. Maybe we should send this uh, set of slides to the White House 
uh, and, and see what their view is. Uh, thank you so much. Very interesting perspective. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. And thank you again for your time. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. My pleasure. So um, we now have um, Greg, uh, who's going to present Jan's slides. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, she has a personal uh, preoccupation right now. And then uh, Greg is going to address his own topic. Um, so Greg, you're, you're up next. I you think okay? you're on mute. Okay, Hi, good. Can you okay? Can you hear me now? Yes, I All can right. hear you. No problem. Right. You're fine. I was on mute. My bad. Uh, well, thank you, Chris, and and thank you, Lorenzo. That was um, a very good, enlightening presentation for me. And I agree with you, Chris. I think it would be helpful to uh, send that to our White House and see what happens. Although, right now, with our White House, um, anything goes about what could happen about uh, anything that we give them as far as science-based or, uh, or insurance or anything else. But again, um, as, as Chris said, Jan Mulligan was supposed to be doing the first part of this presentation, um, waivers under the PREP Act. So I, again, I, this is really her expertise. I will true, do my best to try and uh, give her some credence because uh, this is her topic and she's truly an expert in it. Whoops, went, went too far. Sorry about this, trying to get the, okay. Got it. Not the best on technology, but anyway, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what is the, the, the PREP Act? Essentially, it's the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. It was signed by George Bush back in, in 2005 uh, really under a lot of controversy. It, it was the purpose of it was really to shield vaccine and manufacturers and drug companies um, from financial risk. And, you know, in the event that they were trying to develop vaccines or testing products or anything else to deal with a national pandemic. Um, back then, it was in 2005, they were concerned with the, if you recall, the avian or the bird flu. That was supposed to be the first, you know, one of the big ones that we dealt with that folks thought were potentially going to be of pandemic nature. Luckily, it, it didn't happen, but uh, the act was signed at that point, and, and, and that was sort of the background. Um, since then, it's actually been um, used a couple of times. It was used with, with Ebola and with Zika, and now again, um, we're using it with COVID-19. And on March 13th, President Trump issued an emergency proclamation triggering the PREP Act and its immunity protection, um, and again, authorizing the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to issue statutory waivers um, with PrEP that are particularly related to, to COVID-19. Um, the issue, even though President Trump signed it on March 13th, he actually backdated the implication of the law, so it would take effective um, on February 4th of 2020, and it's actually going to be in place, at least for now, up until October 1st of 2020. So as I said, the, the act really provides liability for what they call countermeasures used for pandemics and you know other major disasters. So what is that's the term of art that really drives the whole legislation. So what is a countermeasure? And really it's anything used to treat, diagnose, cure, prevent, or in this case, you know, mitigate COVID-19. So that includes, again, you can see these are more, these are this is a less geared towards sort of medical malpractice for treatment, things of that sort, and more towards the industries of, of vaccination, testing, putting out those products. So it's it it includes any antiviral medications, you know, any other drug. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some suits filed with the hydrochloroquine and how that was initially touted by the White House and ended up not being uh, the drug everyone thought it would. And actually, I think the FDA uh, the Federal Drug Administration in the in the U.S. put uh, put out a warning against it uh, because it could cause harm and 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 actually death in patients who had any sort of heart conditions. Um, any biologic that used, any diagnostic test. Again, right now that's at least in the United States that's the big push to try and find uh, testing and testing fast and try and get it out there, test as many folks as we can. As a lot of states are coming off of lockdown and into what they call opening the economy up. And I think everybody acknowledges what's gonna be important for that 
just to see how we're doing and, and to do testing. So again, there's a lot of labs, a lot of big time, you know, like Abbott and, and Pfizer have been working on vaccines, been working on labs. This is really gears at, at, at those folks and liability for those folks. So, you know, we know now what a countermeasure is. Who's immune for, for doing these countermeasures under the PrEP Act? Again, it's manufacturers. I've talked about that. These are the drug manufacturers of the world, the, the folks like Abbott who have been uh, who did the rapid fire, which rapid fire being the COVID-19 test where you get results and I guess about as little as 20, as little as 48 hours. Um, program planners, it's a definition that's evolved over time, um, but essentially it's it's individuals. Um, it's really it's for state and local governments. These are really what the program planner's liability is, is geared towards. Uh, but along with that, it's anybody who's employed by them, any vendors they're using to put out these projects um, to help plan, uh, to help you know, come up with a distribution plan, for, for example, for testing. If it does get to a point with a vaccine, these are the folks who are going to be in charge of figuring out how that's going to work, how many they're going to need, how we're going to disperse it, what order we're going to disperse it. Again, those are really what the program planners are. Uh, there's qualified persons. These are healthcare and other providers, including vol volunteers who are working with this, implementing this, um, and, and officials, agents, and employees of, of the United States and other government entities. And, you know, they're the, um, right after it came out, I think in April, the Department of Health and Human Services put out a guidance sheet on the PrEP Act and li liabilities immunities. And one of the things that they emphasized was, again, really the focus on trying everything we can to, to find testing devices, to, to find better vaccines, to find a vaccine, better treatments and everything for COVID-19 as urgently as possible. And in their, in their guidance memo, HHS said, we're really trying to take the most broad reading of this as possible to provide the most broad liability protections we can Give an example of a qualified person as being, for example, and this is right out of their example, you have a pharmacist who's, who's distributing uh, vaccines and he or she doesn't realize that they're, you know, because they've been involved with it, that their license expired in the middle of all this. Um, technically, they would not be a covered person. They would not be a licensed pharmacist. But again, if they're acting in good faith with all the other aspects of the acts and reasonably thought they were a covered person, totally didn't realize their license was up, they're going to be for the most likely included as a covered person, even though they didn't meet that, meet that criteria. So again, the government trying to take a liberal expand, a liberal view of this. This is uh, one of Jan's little, little cartoons, I think is kind of funny. Um, this is again about the testing. It's been very controversial in the United States where um, we don't, we're worried that we don't have enough tests. It's actually become a political sort of ping pong back and forth. And here's one, looks to be a drive-in testing location. And the person says, see, we have plenty of tests available. And the woman says, but the husband actually says to his wife, yeah, well, this one says I'm pregnant. So couldn't have actually been the right one. So there it is. As far as exceptions, there's got to be some exceptions to the liability, and there is. And really, this exception is really basically a, misful, a willful misconduct standard that results in death and, or serious physical injury. Now, serious physical injury is defined under the Act as life-threatening or requires medical or surgical intervention um, to preclude permanent impairment of a body function or result in permanent damages to the body. And the willful misconduct here, it, it's got to meet actually three criteria. It's greater than any form of recklessness or negligence. And then the PREP Act definition is an act or failure to act that is taking one intentionally to achieve a wrongful purpose, knowingly without legal or factual justification. And three, disregard of a known or obvious risk that risk that is so great as to make it highly probable that the harm will outweigh the benefit. So again, this seems to me to be a very, um, you know, a high standard to meet. Um, and all three of these conditions must be proven with clear and convincing evidence. So again, there are exceptions, but these exceptions seem very hard to meet, which again goes with the theme of the government trying to view this as broadly as possible to give people immunity so that they can really put their efforts into vaccines, testing, and so forth.
without worrying about if they're going to get sued for every little piece of it. Um, an exception uh, to the exception is that willful misconduct cannot be found. So again, this is even greater protections not be found to if you have a manufacturer like a drug manufacturer or distributor that are for actions that are regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and if HHS chooses not to take an enforcement action or if HHS terminates or settles an enforcement action, that means something happened and HHS is investigating it. Um, if they either don't take action or if they settle the case at some point without impose, imposing criminal, civil, or administrative penalties, then the exceptions don't apply, uh, the exceptions to liability. And the same thing, uh, you know, a program planner or a qualified person who's acting in accordance with, hmm, I think I lost my slide there. Anyway, as far as there, here we go. I'm sorry about this. Slides of anyway, there we go. The program planner is acting in accordance with the applicable directions and guidelines, recommendations issued by HHS, um, and and you know, or the state or health local department is notified about the injury. So if they have an injury that happens, but as long as they're following the guidelines of HHS, they report it to their state agency, they're for the most part going to be immune under the PREPS Act. Now, who is immunity? When is it not available? Again, it's not available for, this is just right now COVID-19. It's not available for activities for situations outside of COVID-19. It's not available for proclaims unrelated. Again, these are mostly um, manufacturing of drugs, manufacturing of vaccines, manufacturing of treatments, manufacturing of testing. So it's again, um, it's really focused on those types of events and it's not available for foreign claims. The US has no jurisdiction um, unless the claim is based on events that take place in a US territory or there is another link to the US. But if some of this happens and it's across, Across the pond, as they say, or it's in a different country, the immunity is most likely not going to apply. Um, accident will, you know, willful misconduct. Is there any compensation for injury? If it does get to a point and there is misconduct, well, you know, the exceptions go away, the person is found liable. There's actually a fund put out there, a covered countermeasure uh, process fund, the CICP, that has funds actually appropriated from the government that can be used help fund these liability cases and to help pay some of those folks back to pay death benefits um, and so forth. So there is a fund, even if, again, even if you're one of these manufacturers and held liable, there is a fund that's out there with the government that can that can help with that. Um, one quick example of, of how uh, far the government has taken this, or at least the courts, there was a case, Parker versus St. Louis County, it happened in, um, in New York. Um, they upheld the PrEP app protections for county for a county conducting school-based vaccinations. And this is back in response to the H1N1, another one of the viruses we were really concerned about um, a few years ago. A nurse inadvertently vaccinated a kindergartner who didn't have informed consent. Uh, in the United States, uh, you have to have informed consent for any medical, medical procedure, especially one as invasive as giving a vaccine, about putting a needle in someone's arm. And it gets especially dicey when there's a child involved, obviously. Um, the initial trial court denied the motion to dismiss, saying that the PREP Act really didn't go this far to deal with situations of informed consent. But however, the appellate court overruled that, um, saying that you know the PREP Act preempted any claims under state law and the breadth of liability immunity provided under the PREP Act precluded claims of negligence and battery. So they've actually taken it that far. And again, real quickly, without getting into this, we have the PREP Act. Um, that's one of the layer of, of protections out there. Also, almost all states are now either have in place with COVID-19 or in the process of putting in place uh, liability protections for, for healthcare employees, for healthcare providers, for, for hospitals, some nursing homes, some not nursing homes. It varies state by state. Here's an example Jan put up of California and the state she lives in, the state I live in Pennsylvania. We have, have one as well. Uh, there's some um, uh, a lot of concern that it hasn't gone too far, but again, we're not finished with this yet. 
um, there's going to be liability protections down the road. And again, uh, that was part of what Jan's presentation was. Mine actually still kicks up on that in a little bit. Uh, the CARES Act, which um, the CARES Act, which is essentially the the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. It was signed in March 27th. It made a lot of fanfare here because it was actually a three trillion, or excuse me, a two trillion dollar stimulus package. Um, it recruited, it included relief for um, a lot of providers. It included relief for a lot of biz, small businesses, pay loan protection programs, a lot of things that went into it. But what we're going to focus here really is the provider relief portion of that. Um, there was a hundred billion dollars that went to providers to help them prepare for uh, COVID-19. And the first thing, again, just going along, following Lorenzo's lead and, and Jan's lead on the liability, one of the things that was added was a limitation of liability for volunteer healthcare professionals who are doing anything with COVID. So essentially the way this worked was under the CARES Act, if you're a healthcare professional, you're working within the scope of your license, and you're this is important, you're acting as a volunteer, you have strong liability protections, again, unless you've um, you know, unless you gazed in, you know, there was criminal, willful or criminal misconduct, gross negligence, reckless conduct, uh, a constant flagrant indifference to the rights of others. But again, what's interesting about this, it's just for volunteers. I've actually have used it uh, with one of my clients who was, uh, with all the stress that's going on with, with the healthcare workers in COVID-19 across the country. Um, I used to be a psychologist before I went to private, before I became a lawyer. Um, and one of my old practice folks called me up, one of my old colleagues, and said, one of our psychiatrists is trying to put together a support line to help physicians on the front line. So anyway, they ended up getting 600 psychiatrists across the country, and there is a, a private line, or not a, it's a secured line that these folks can call if they're physicians, it's a physician-to-physician -physician purpose. Uh, if these physicians are having a hard time, they're stressed out, they're dealing with it, they can call one of these psychiatrists and get some free counseling. Again, this is all on a volunteer basis. They're clearly covered under this act. So this made it a lot easier to get this up and running and get the volunteers they need for, which has truly turned out to be a great service. Um, and again, without getting in too much into detail, I wanted to talk about the CARES Act itself, as far as the Provider Relief Fund, which has been very important and very much of a lifeline to these hospitals. A lot of hospitals in the United States, one of the uh, restrictions right in the beginning was that they had to stop performing elective and uh, elective procedures, elective surgeries, you know, basically non-admission ones. These are the things that are really the bread and butter of, 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 of a hospital's revenue. And to just take those away and uh, was one, a big hit in itself. Two, there's a lot of patients, and hopefully we'll get to this in a minute with the CARES Act, who are coming in. Uh, this hits, at least in America, it's hit a lot of those who are in the low social economic status. They are poor. They don't have health insurance. So on top of losing one of their big money makers in these elective insurances, or excuse me, in elective uh, procedures, providers are getting hit by having to provide very expensive COVID treatment to a lot of folks who just can't pay for it. So the CARES Act was there to really help these providers who are financially struggling. The first allocation was $100 billion. And the first was the, what they call the general allocation. Out of that $100 million, um, 50 it was going to be a general allocation, and 30 of that went right out the door, right off the bat. Um, although, interestingly, uh, when they announced this, Seema Verma, who's uh, in head of CMS, which in the United States is the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services, said, quote, this will be no strings attached. We just want to get the money out there as soon as we can. The money was completely based on Medicare revenues from 2019. You know, they had a basically straight percentage of that. Whatever you made in 2019, they took a percentage. That $30 million ended up in your account literally within three or four days uh, for, for most folks. Um, and she said, you know, no strings attached. Hospitals can use this however they want. Well, as I'll talk about in a little minute, that wasn't quite the case. Um, hospitals, in order to get this, had to either sign on uh, to a number of terms and conditions that were literally about 10 to 15 pages long. Uh, and you had to satisfy every single one of those to get that money. Um, if you if you didn't satisfy, it used to be 30 days, they extended it to 45, 
if you accepted the money and didn't do any certification within 45 days, you were deemed to have accepted these terms and conditions. So that went for the first $30 million. If you weren't one of the recipients of that 30 million, you were then able to try and apply for um, the additional $20 million of, of that initial 50 general allocation. You had to send in tax reforms, proof of loss, losses due to COVID-19 and so forth. Now, as far as the second $50 million, billion, um, these are what they call targeted allocations. Um, 100, you know, there was 12 billion to 395 hospitals in high impact areas. These were obviously a lot of the hospitals in New York got hit very hard. Um, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, a lot of the big cities or even some of the rural areas uh, that got just really hit hard. A lot of places that you've heard near the meatpacking plants, that 12 billion was to go to those hospitals. Um, 10 billion for rural health clinics, uh, rural hospitals and community mental health centers. Uh, this is still unspecified, but a number of what's left is supposed to go to treatment of the uninsured. As I said, a lot of the folks coming in uh, needing COVID-19 treatment uh, really just don't have the money for it, don't have insurance. This is to help out hospitals deal with that. $400 million to Indian Health Services Fund. Um, the American Indians of Native American population in the United States is one that's really been hit hard. Uh, there's a reservation in Gallup, New Mexico, that I think has the highest per capita in this, uh, you know, highest per capita amount of both uh, infections and death rates. So it's it's very much needed funds. Now, um, as I said, there's some potential liability here. These this money was in the form of grants, not having to be paid back. However, it's not quite so clear as as anything is with the government. Um, essentially, as I said, there is about 10 to 15 pages worth of terms and conditions. You've got to abide by those. Um, one of the things that the CARES Act also funds, which didn't get as much publicity, is it funded a significant amount of money uh, for, quote, monitoring and enforcement. That means they're going to look and see if you're spending the money the way you should. And if you don't, you may either have to pay it back or pay some penalties. Um, and they even have a special uh, Inspector General, unless I don't know what time, it's been a couple of days now um, since one's been fired, but at least this provides for an Inspector General uh, to oversee just this provider allocation fund and make sure everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, there's no graph, there's no misuse of the funds, and so forth. And again, for both the $30 billion and the $20 billion, and even some of the more targeted funds, again, they have a lot of um, terms and conditions. One of those terms and conditions that they have to do quarterly reporting, where they basically have to track the amount received um, of the money coming in, how they're spending the money, what programs they're using. If they complain that they needed the money based on losses due to COVID-19, they had to end up sending in money to prove that. So again, if you're a provider receiving these funds, in my experience is a lot of the bigger providers have this in place, a lot of the smaller ones may not, um, is that you really got to have yourself almost a little shadow team of, of auditors within your system just monitoring that money. You've got to flow exactly where it goes. As I say, um, follow the money the government will. If, if you don't, if you can't prove where this money went, you're either going to have to return it or be subject to penalty or even the False Claims Act, which is a very, um, very difficult to deal with uh, federal statute if you're a, a provider. They can, your monies can be multiplied. There's what they call treble damages for each single claim so that your, your damages can multiply pretty quick if they think you didn't spend it the way you were supposed to. But that's the funder piece of the CARES Act. Um, and as I said, there was also the Limitation of Liability Act. Uh, in closing, one of the last things, uh, if I have some time, I wanted to talk about briefly was there's been almost on a, when this started, uh, we started looking at this back in March, is right around the second week of March is when things started just flying out of the government. There was what they call blanket uh, Medicare waivers. Medicare has a lot of rules and rule and uh, obligations of, of how the monies have to be spent, what has to be done with it. Uh, how you can be paid for things. You have to certify certain coverage criteria. Uh, a lot of waivers started happening almost you know, several times a day on a daily basis. It was dizzying to keep up with them. 
Uh, but it's been a good thing. It's loosening restrictions so that providers can get paid for um, for certain services that much been, may, may have been more difficult to do before. I think one of the biggest examples of this is telehealth. Um, again, a, one of the most important steps to mitigate this virus is, of course, social distancing. We want to keep people, you know, if not in their homes, but social distancing, not take any trips they don't have to take. And one of the things is they, we didn't want people to have is that they're having, you know, cold symptoms or even symptoms with something else. Uh, we didn't want people sitting in a waiting room of 40 people with people coughing, some wearing masks, some not wearing masks. So telehealth, which is just basically, you know, like this, looking at your patient, a doctor and patient looking at each other, typically um, with audio and remote, with audio and video capabilities to, to discuss what their treatment is and maybe then call in a prescription. Um, and again, recognizing the, the imperative uh, during this public health crisis that patient travel only when, you know, avoid travel when possible. This was considered a way to get people a lot of treatment while still practicing safe social distancing at the same time. So now they did a lot of blanket waivers, at least under the Medicare program, and Medicare can now pay for office, hospital, and other visits furnished by telehealth um, across the country and included in the patient's place of residence. Before, um, you know, like if I do telehealth now, I can do it sitting in my living room, my basement, wherever, whereas before I would have had to actually go to a hospital or a special clinic that did telemedicine. And it really was typically, um, as I said in the third one here, it typically would only pay in a limited basis when the person receiving the service was in a designated rural area. And, you know, when they leave their home and go to a clinic or hospital. Again, going to a clinic or hospital get telehealth defeats the purpose of the social distancing. So though uh, Medicare got away with those recommendations, got away with those requirements, it's now wide open, at least to the end of the epidemic, the national emergency. Um, as I say, it's it's going to last as long as that. And also HIPAA got involved because anytime you start thinking about anytime you start thinking about doing things online, any public protected health information online, in the United States, you have to worry about HIPAA, which protects protected health inf health information and the you know inappropriate use of disclosure. So back on March 20th, the Office of Civil Rights, which is the basically watchdog for HIPAA, um, issued guidance on telehealth remote communications um, following the you know the president's notification of the national emergency. And and this notification of a, it's basically a notification of enforcement discretion. It didn't do away with any provisions in HIPAA. It just said, for now, we're not going to enforce the following provisions. Um, most of these were geared towards telehealth. Um, and basically, it said that OCR would not impose penalties for HIPAA violations against healthcare providers in connection with their, quote, good faith provision of telehealth using certain communication technology during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, the important part there is using the right technology, which they put out a, a guidance, which is easily able to find online. It's very helpful. It's in a, a for, an FAQ type of format. And one of the things that they said was it had to be a non-public facing vehicle that you were using for telehealth. So, so what is a non-public facing remote communication product? I wasn't quite sure what they meant by that either. So uh, it's defined as Remote, a remote communication product that is one that, as default, allows only the intended parties to participate in the communication. It's got to be, you know, password protected, encrypted, just to, you know, just I can get on and talk to my doctor and I can't have Chris Kendi trying to hack in and bomb into my service. It's got to just be me and the physician. So according to, uh, to OCR, some of these non-public platforms include products such as um, Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, um, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts, the WhatsApp video chat, which I wasn't even aware of, which seems to go back to an older television commercial, or, or Skype. Um, interestingly, um, one of the initial ones as well listed in this, which still applies, is Google. As you know, Google's come under a lot of scrutiny lately for, for some uh, enforcement discretion or for some um, security problems with people, what they call bombing onto Zoom. Uh, there's, you know, anything as egregious as, you know, children and their teachers doing a Zoom class online and all of a sudden someone 
crashing that and putting pornography, you know, pornographic pictures up front. So Zoom, even though Zoom's not that safe, it's one of the ones that was listed in this FAQ, but the FAQ came out before a lot of these. So if I were a provider, you know, again, they talk about it being good faith. Uh, if you have to use Zoom, you have to use it. Again, I think it would often be advisable to try something else, given all of the, the real strong publicity out there about the weakness in their security platforms. But again, that's um, they've you know Zoom has actually talked about revamping those, so they may be a um, again I would I would do my research before jumping in, but uh, Zoom is one that um, was initially on the list, uh, had a lot of problems with security, and now seems to be trying to get that back up again. Um, do knew a lot of I do know a lot of healthcare providers that still to this day use Zoom and enjoy it and have had no problems with it. And oh, before I glow, the last thing I think is what is a non-public um, facing communication? These are typically platforms that employ Sorry. The hardest time with these slides. Yeah, again, typically these are platforms that employ end-to-end -end encryption which allows only an individual and the person with whom the individual communicates to see what is transmitted. Um, they you know, have individual user accounts, passwords. It's very difficult to get in. They talk about things like TikTok, which is not quite, doesn't have quite the same level of, um, you know, of protections. And that's not one of the ones. In fact, that was one of the ones listed in the OCR guide. So I think in closing, because I think I'm getting probably close to time here, Chris, is that I think the telehealth expansion is something that makes complete sense in this pandemic where you're supposed to social isolate. This is a way to get a lot of treatments with your physician, say you've got diabetes, say you've got some other medication where, or some other condition that requires constant monitoring, constant medication. These are ways you can touch in with your, your doctor and you know he or she can prescribe something if they need to, try a different course of action, all without having the you know, drive in and then sit in a, you know, a big waiting room. It's, it's you know, a lot of the restrictions that a lot of folks have been complaining about for a long time have been lifted, particularly that it had to only occur in rural settings and that you actually couldn't do it from your own home. You had to go somewhere like a hospital or a specialized clinic to do the telehealth. Um, and again, with HIPAA relaxing, or at least for now, um, opening up its, its enforcement discretion to allow people more access and as long as they're acting in good faith, it just give them more opportunities and chances to try this. I think it's been a huge success. It's been something that uh, there's been a lot of articles written on um, that this is exactly, this is the type of, uh, you know, healthcare that is exactly needed in the time of this epidemic. And again, a lot of these were stopped. Uh, the, the coverage, the blanket coverage waivers for Medicare and at the end of the pandemic, there's been, and initially there was a lot of hope that once the genie was out of the bottle, so to speak, now telehealth was out there, it was going to be hard to bring it back in and put on these restrictions. Um, and that, you know, these telehealth, the opening up of telehealth was here to stay. However, there's been a little bit of pushback with that lately. I think some insurers themselves are wondering down the road how much this is going to cost them. But for now, it's in place. I think for now, it's been a very good thing. And there's a lot of hope that a lot of these, you know, the opening them up, so to speak, of telehealth will continue beyond the epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That was, uh, first of all, thank you for standing in for Jan. I know that was a little difficult. You had to do some homework there. appreciate that. I'm sure Jan does. And thank you for the really interesting presentation. Um, I have a few slides. We're over time. Um, Colette, should we continue or just wrap up? What do you think? Uh, sorry. Yes, we, we can still continue uh, if you want, Chris. I see that people are still there and uh, we still have time if you want. Okay, I will try to do this in about five minutes and then uh, we can wrap up. And um, uh, I only have one question, which was for uh, Judge Reyes, which I will uh, which uh, I will address as soon as I'm done, um, assuming I can get the slides to work also. Um, do I have control of the slides? Colette? Yes, it's yeah, not, 
Okay, it doesn't seem to be advancing. Okay. Let me do it for you. Okay, so um, I'll just tell you it's not advancing. So uh, maybe you can do it for me and I'll just go very fast. Which, which slide do you want, Chris? Uh, just, just start them and, and um, just go to my set. I think it's right after this one. There we go, okay. Um, so let's just move, next slide. Uh, basically, I was going to uh, address uh, very quickly um, one possible response uh, that the government is considering, um, which is uh, to follow in the steps of something called TRIA, which was the um, Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. Don't seem to be moving them. They're not moving forward. Can you do the next one? If it's going to take too long, I'm going to wrap up because I don't want people to just wait for the slides to move. Um, Anyway, here we go. Okay, so we're starting. Uh, now we're going back too far. Um, essentially, um, essentially following 9-11, um, the government, which, which resulted, here it is, that's okay, good. So in 9-11, as a result of the uh, terrorist acts, which everybody knows about, um, there was a reaction by the insurance market to exclude terrorism risks from cover of any kind of cover for property loss or business interruption. Um, the government responded by passing a statute called the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act, um, which was um, uh, a, what we would call a backstop or a form of reinsurance to um, protect the industry and allow for the industry to offer uh, terrorism risk insurance. Just note that this is personal, this is personal to me. It's not an official position of Cozen O'Connor. So what happened was that the government, uh, President Bush signed TRIA. It took, it took a while. It was over a year. And it created what we would call a backstop, which is essentially reinsurance. The insurers were insured for exposure to terrorism risk over a certain amount. It was originally $5 million. It's now much higher. Um, it was... Um, it required that insurers offer terrorism risk uh, to uh, to their clients. It did not have to be accepted, but it had to be offered, uh, and they were only on the hook for a certain amount over which the federal government would reinsure. Uh, it's much higher than the original five million now. I think it's 200 million, um, and it's been renewed several times. It's in effect through 2027. So, uh, following in the steps of, of TRIA. A very similar reaction has occurred. Many property and casualty insurers uh, have uh, provided exclusions for the pandemic. Uh, business interruption cover is being excluded. Um, much business interruption cover requires physical damage. Uh, in many instances, clearly businesses have shut down, but they aren't suffering any physical damage. They're just closed because of the pandemic. Um, there's been some argument that the virus itself is the equivalent of some kind of physical injury, but that's uh, a fairly uh, minority opinion. It's been rejected by many courts. And of course, many states are trying to pass legislation to require insurance companies to cover business interruption, even though it would be excluded, um, which I think raises major constitutional and public policy considerations. I think those attempts, and Peter would probably be better, better seated to advise on that, um, I think they're going to be serious constitutional and public policy considerations uh, to force insurers to cover uh, for risks that they never got premium for and never included in the coverage language. So the, the, the U.S. House Financial Services Committee has, has provided some legislation very similar to TRIA, uh, which would provide reinsurance for losses over $250 million. The program would be voluntary, which means that insurers would have to enroll, but they didn't. They weren't required to, uh, and they weren't required to offer the pandemic cover uh, in the event they aren't participating in the program. Um, a federal fund would cover 
the balance over the 250 million up to 500 billion um, for, for the losses and the 5% balance would be spread among insurers. Um, but their exposure would be limited to the 250 million. Um, TRIA required that there actually be a formal declaration of a, um, of a uh, terrorist uh, act, um, but that's never actually happened since 9-11. And uh, this, this legislation would be the same. We would need to have the government, either the Secretary of State or the President declare a covered health emergency uh, and the premium would be covered um, by a, a, a fund that would be created to which the insurers would pay premium for the reinsurance. Uh, and there would be reporting requirements. Um, I, I'm not sure that um, this is in the preliminary stage uh, insurers are very concerned legitimately about pricing this type of risk, given the scope of this. It was one thing for 9-11 where it was geographically localized. There were a specific number of, of victims and losses. This is a pandemic. It's worldwide. Uh, and therefore, um, I think there are going to be serious issues with respect to pricing, uh, which I cannot second guess the, the market on, given the uh, difficulty of figuring out the expanse of this risk. Uh, and it's much too early to tell whether the legislation will pass, uh, but there clearly is great pressure on the insurance industry uh, to respond to this. And I think many of you have seen articles um, where um, it's indicated that that would probably bankrupt Lloyd's if they had to cover some of the extensive losses here. And there's obviously no solution. Some of the legislation is trying to deal with it um, and we'll see what happens. So that's really a very quick overview of the uh, possibility, maybe one day, of having uh, having uh, a backstop of some sort so that this type of risk can be covered, but that's not at all clear uh, it's going to happen or that it even would be good for the insurance industry. So that's my very brief presentation on that. Um, I wanted to just pass on one. I had one question, which was actually in Spanish to Peter, which I, I sort of figured out. And I think the question had to do with whether hospitals are severally or jointly liable or medically responsible in the US for exposure uh, due to uh, the pandemic. And that was a question from a Mr. Ruben Acosta. Peter, do you have a view on that? Peter, you're on mute. You're on mute. We can't, we can't hear you. Okay, can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah, so it, it's a great question. Unfortunately, I cannot answer it because I, that is an issue that conceivably could become before our court. In fact, I, I thought all of you raised a lot of interesting issues that more likely than not will come before the courts. Uh, I think that is one of the key issues that's going to arise is who is going to be responsible for harm that comes to people are the hospitals going to be liable? Is there going to be legislation either at the state level or at the federal level to provide immunity for hospitals, for hospital workers, for pharmacists, doctors, nurses, nursing assistants, all of the various people that are working with individuals? Uh, that, that That's going to be an issue that I I think is going to very likely come before both the state and federal courts in the United States. Uh, as our colleagues in, in France mentioned, uh, I think there are issues that are gonna come up in all around the world, in Italy and France and, and countries around the world as to these liability issues. I don't have an answer. Uh, all I can say is that uh, it, it's certainly one that I would not be surprised that we are going to be addressing both in the United States and around the world. I think there actually is, I've read there's some, there's some legislation which is being proposed, which I think the uh, uh, leader McConnell is, is insisting that there be immunity for, for the development of the vaccine and for various other medical interests as part of the legislation, which of course is receiving put pushback from the plaintiff's bar uh, and consumer groups. But I, that's clearly a very, very hot issue as to whether and to what extent um, there's gonna be immunity. Of course, Greg addressed that. There is legislation in effect already, which creates some protection. Uh, the question is how, how long will that last and how far will it go, as I understood from Greg's presentation. 
Yes, and this is Greg, and you're exactly right, Chris. I think as we're looking at the next, the Congress is looking at the next round of stimulus funding, uh, round four. That issue you just brought up, I think, is is one of the big ones um, that's going to play out between the Democrats and Republicans, and um, it's one that I know the administration and and Mitch McConnell and Republicans are very strong at having um, these protections as any part of any sort of future funding. Well, I want to thank you all again. We've actually kept a pretty substantial majority of the people who were participating in the webinar. Thank you for your patience, audience. And I want to thank all the speakers. I thought the presentations were outstanding, varied, uh, and um, extremely stimulating. So thank you all again. And please, everybody, stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you to Colette for all her assistance. I apologize. My internet went down for a couple of minutes. You may have lost my visual. I, I'm glad it came back on. I was in a little bit of a panic there, but it came back on. So again, thank you all and stay safe. And thank you, Colette. Thank you very thank much, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful job.